changing practice to impact and trying to get across some of the key basics with respect to starting to make change in your hospitals and using the impact as the what we're trying to change. And today we'll try to cover off some of the how, which is probably of um, new interest to you in terms of change management practices. And so much of this learning actually came from Morty phase one, but also in addition to our learning here at the UW team in terms of implementation science. So a huge thank you needs to go out first off to Celia, who, who's doing her PhD work with me, as you may know. And uh, a lot of the understanding of that we have around how to make things work from phase one came from her thesis work. So she's done a huge amount of work and much of the learning that we have in these slides and also her review of these slides to make sure that they had the correct content. Again, a th great thank you to Celia for that. So we're going to talk first off about the success of more to eat what made it work, understanding how to change behavior, and changing knowledge, attitudes, and practices of staff uh, members. What we say is our key ingredients, what was in the, in, in the recipe, in essence, for phase one, how to go about building the change in your site, then talking a little bit about roles and responsibilities and where you need to start over the next couple of months in terms of making change. So as you know, the Integrated Nutrition Pathway for Acute Care is an algorithm that is based on uh, evidence as well as field tested now with phase one being complete. And there are some minor modifications to impact based on that phase one testing. And specifically, I'll just highlight for you here, one key change was that after subject global assessment is completed by a dietitian and the person is found to be SGA B or C, we leave it to the discretion of that dietitian to determine if an SGA B, SGA B person also requires a comprehensive nutrition assessment. Because unit to unit, hospital to hospital, whom you might see in terms of SGA B patients might be quite different. And we want to live, live, give that flexibility back to the patients in the hospitals to do that work. The other key thing that, oh, sorry, uh, go back here. The other key difference um, that we have in the impact that is this version that was updated from phase one is that we include um, food intake being improved, moving people back to standard care and using the less than or equal to 50% as the criterion for moving a person up in care. Otherwise, the impact worked extremely well in phase one, and we found that the key aspects of screening on admission and SGA triage within one or two days of admission worked very well and helped to streamline processes and care for patients. So as you know, what Impact is an evidence-based algorithm for the detection, treatment, and monitoring of malnutrition amongst acute care medical and surgical patients is developed through consensus from leading Canadian experts, clinicians, and other stakeholders. It is a minimum standard. So if a hospital does above and beyond this standard, they're encouraged to keep up that high quality practice. Key steps are that at day one, a patient is screened on admission using the two questions from the Canadian Nutrition Screening Tool. In day one or day two, the person is triaged in terms of being, if they're found at risk, going through subject global assessment to diagnose malnutrition, determine what the next steps may be for that patient. In addition, there's a step of advanced nutrition care strategies for the mild and moderately malnourished patient, as well as severely malnourished patient. Dietitian providing specialized care where required, whether it be SJB or C. All patients receiving standard care procedures to promote, promote food intake. Monitoring how patients are doing using their food intake, and of course, discharge planning. We found um, that a variety of professionals had to be involved in this. And so when we talk about implementing impact, it's not one person that's doing this or one role within the unit. It does take the entire unit to do a good job with nutrition care in terms of prevention, detection, and treatment. And so, for example, physicians recognize the importance of nutrition whenever they are doing their own assessment and involving um, discussion of nutrition at rounds, for example or in key treatments. Volunteers being involved in a variety of ways, such as through mealtime support and encouragement. So everyone has a role to play. It truly is an integrated plan of care. So some of the key points out of more to eat phase one we're gonna cover off now. First off, the, the, the project had three phases. One was a developmental phase, which was about six months in length, or four or five months in length, September to December of 2015. 
we understood what was actually happening currently in the hospitals and um, did a lot of data collection around uh, what needed to change in essence. The next phase was implementation, which was for one full calendar year, January to December 2016, and then sustainability January to March of 2017. In each of the five phase one hospitals, every site did screening, every site did SGA triage of patients, and every site did MedPass. Other aspects of impact were picked up variably depending on the hospital and their priorities. As a result of all hospitals picking up the top three uh, activities, this is why phase two is focused in on those activities first and focusing in on making change there. And then if there's opportunity within the next year, sites can also work towards other activities to improve nutrition care, such as taking regular weights on admission and during the hospital stay. This is just showing you the success of the approach that we had in phase one and demonstrating that our ingredients for success and our recipe does work. You can see that from uh, phase one, which is period one here on the chart, this is the average across all five hospitals on the left-hand side of the screen. You can see that screening went dramatically up. We did have three sites at baseline, or sorry, two sites at baseline who were doing some screening, but not fully. You can see, however, by the end of the study project, everybody was sustaining uh, screening, and by about the third period of data collection, everybody was doing a really good job with screening at 60% uh, or so and higher. In addition to that, you can see the dramatic change in using SGA to diagnose malnutrition. So on the left-hand side, again, is the average across all five sites, and on the right-hand side figure is each individual site. And you can see, again, a dramatic change from no use of SGA at baseline through to using SGA and then consistently using SGA over the time period of the study, including the sustainability phase. This further slide actually documents a specific site and one example in one month what happened. So in this example, 85% of patients were screened at admission, and that was 59 of 68 patients in the impact audit. 34% of those were identified to be at nutrition risk. Of those, which was 20 people, 16 received an SGA, so 80% received an SGA, and 20% were on a referral list to get an SGA done. So we had basically 100% of tracking through from risk to getting SGA. And then of those that were SGA B and C, it was 13 people here out of 16, you can see 100% got a full assessment or comprehensive assessment by a dietitian. So again, the 100% tracking through to the, the full care for B and C patients. So this is highly successful. And that's what we're hoping to see in each of the phase two sites as well. Some other key changes that were noted as part of phase one were that we were able to improve advanced care, the use of med pass, weekly weights, and food intake monitoring. So as you can see here from this slide, at baseline, 30% of patients in their baseline data collection at all five sites got some type of advanced care practice. This could be anything from preferred foods or menu marking, uh, liberalized diet, more food between meals or use of supplements. And that doubled basically through to follow up. So we were in essence through the screening and SJ triage process, leading patients to getting more advanced care sooner in their stay, we think, with respect to helping them um, with their potential malnutrition. MedPass have had a sevenfold increase. It went from 2% on average at baseline to 15% during the follow-up. So again, a huge success. Weekly weights went from 3% of patients at baseline to 21%. You might think, well, that's not as much of a success as you would think, but not every site worked on weekly weights. Actually, only two sites of the five worked on weekly weights after the screening SGA and MedPass were implemented. And food intake monitoring was uh, at baseline 1% and it went up to over 30% um, at uh, the end of the study. And again, it was only three sites that really took on food intake monitoring as a key activity um, during the implementation phase of phase one. 
Just a note, food intake monitoring to count in impact, and we'll talk about this when we do the impact training uh, at our next webinar. It has to be a monitoring that leads to an action when it's low intake. And so it's not just the, the routine um, nursing monitoring around food intake on flow cheats that may happen. It's really the tracking through of that low intake to a, an action that promotes uh, better food intake for the patient. And that, to us, is food intake monitoring. On this slide, we have a few key patient outcomes that were tracked in phase one to show again the success of the more to eat phase one approach with respect to changing practice. And so at baseline, we show the uh, length of stay for all of the five sites. And you can see that on average, there was an increase, or sorry, a decrease in length of stay um, for the sites. On the right hand side, we have a figure that shows as well that mealtime barriers to food intake, the, the uh, line in the middle that shows this trend here that I'm pointing on with my little arrow, that's the average of the five sites. And you can see that there was a dramatic uh, decrease in most sites with respect to mealtime barriers to food intake because of changes that were happening in those units with respect to standard care practices improving. So some other successes of phase one, and this comes from Celia's work doing interviews with team members and um, and key influential folks on the site implementation team in the various hospitals. So dietitians now are advocating for themselves. I'll let you read that, uh, that quote on your own. So a key finding is that we feel that dietitians have a, a renewed sense of purpose and expansion of their role in the um, acute care medical unit that was involved in the study. A champion here noted how incredibly productive she thought the last year was with respect to changing and seeing the rewards of that change uh, in terms of benefit to patients. A manager noted that nutrition is now a priority uh, for the various sites and Celia has done some follow-up interviews with the original phase one hospitals and things have sustained and there's still this momentum of growth and a nutrition culture that was started because of more to eat phase one. And then finally, teamwork. Uh, I think you'll find through this process, because it is truly a collaborative process involving the entire team in decision making around how things should happen, this leads to teamwork on the unit that um, allows the team to come together around this very important issue of supporting patients with their food intake and nutrition. So how do we make that success happen within our phase two sites and beyond for other hospitals that are interested in doing uh, impact implementation? We realized a key factor was education is not enough to change behavior of any team member. Another key point is that context rules. And so what happened in one unit in phase one wasn't necessarily how it could happen in another unit in phase one. And so with our phase two sites, we want you to acknowledge that you can use, you should use the recipe that we've created for you, but recognize your context will be required to be adjusting that recipe and tailoring it to really fit your situation. Um, nothing that we did in one hospital can automatically re replicate another hospital, and even unit to unit, because there is this contextual difference with units in terms of team members, types of patients, processes that may be there that have to be accounted for. So we use theory to help us make change and so this is one of the things we want to try and transmit to you folks today as part of this uh, webinar this idea of some basic theories that help us to understand how to make change and move beyond education as being our primary way of thinking about getting a new practice into place and so this is actually called knowledge translation and the science behind knowledge translation is called implementation science. There's a variety of theories, and I won't bore you with all of those. We'll focus in on two key ones. The knowledge to action cycle you may have seen before, and it basically shows us how we make change. And so I'll just briefly go through that with you in a moment. But also we'll talk about a key uh, framework and behavior change theory called uh, the Mishi's behavior change wheel and the calm B behavior change techniques in this presentation. We found them very useful for our clinical leads who are champions in the phase one sites. Uh, very easy to access and understand the concept. 
the other key comment or component of um, knowledge translation is that you're trying to make change that is sustained. And so we learned some key things uh, about how to um, demonstrate that benefit to the patients and to the team members by making that change and how to feed that back to the team members so it sustains it and also some learnings about how to routinize these activities by changing forms by changing the what we call the environmental context around the team so it makes it easy to do the change that we're wanting them to do so i'll speak more to that as we go through these slides but first the knowledge to action cycle this cycle basically shows us how you can take a bit of knowledge and our bit of knowledge is basically in pack and that's in this in the the center the triangle there the knowledge that we've created is the impact and it's trying to address the problem of how to prevent detect and treat malnutrition in acute care you and your sites are trying to adapt that knowledge to your local context and we have as i say developed a recipe to help support you to do that you need to understand what barriers to knowledge are going to be in your own setting in that unit and work to tailor implement impact around that those barriers and what's going to work in your setting you're going to want to monitor how that knowledge is being used and that's our impact audits that we'll be creating and using um, on redcap you want to evaluate your outcomes again that's the impact audit does that for us but there's other ways such as the administrative data that we're hoping to collect from each site and then finally, we want to sustain that knowledge use. And with phase one, that was creating the virtual toolkit and leaving uh, the great learning with champions in hospital set settings that could actually then transmit and translate that knowledge beyond the single unit that was part of phase one. So that's our goal with Mortite phase two as well. So we'll start specifically with the behavior change wheel that is from Mitch et al. And I'll just briefly explain uh, this and then we'll go into a little bit more detail. Essentially, this behavior change wheel comes from amalgamating a variety of theories and frameworks together and distilling it into one package. So it's really powerful. So Mitch uh, and colleagues suggest that all of behavior is affected by capability, opportunity, and motivation. And I'll unpack those in a moment for you uh, in a little bit more detail. The red circle around the green circle are those things that we call behavior change techniques that can help you change capability. And we'll also unpack that for you in a little bit more detail. On the outside, the gray circle is really a little bit beyond Mortit phase two. It's more of the work of CMTF, for example. For, for example, we're trying to get um, guidelines in place. That's our virtual toolkit is a guideline in, in essence or regulation with respect to Accreditation Canada and getting others to pick up the impact as the best practice in terms of care. And that's another way to start to change behavior within hospitals. But at the local level, it's really around these red uh, behavior change techniques and the green, which is your capability, opportunity and motivation that we're trying to change within our team members. So why do staff do what they do? Basically, they got to understand what it is they want, need to be doing and have the capability to do it, the capacity um, to do it, need to be motivated to do the activity, need to have the opportunity to do it. And so any behavior, not just team members in healthcare, this is anybody's behavior, whether it be your teenage child or your husband in terms of eating behaviors or whomever, you got to change these things in the right combinations to get change in behavior and we call this com b so when we say com b you know what we're talking about is capability motivation opportunity leading to behavior change so i'm just going to unpack that for you a little bit so capability is about the physical capacity and knowledge to do the activity so physical would be skill so this would be sga training for example for dietitians who are doing that in your hospitals they need to be trained and they need to feel comfortable with doing SGA. Knowledge is another way of getting capability across. This is know-how. So in this case, it'd be training nursing staff to use this two CNST question, the Canadian Nutrition Screen Tool questions, educating them on how to ask those questions. Then they have the know-how to do it. And the next step of, in terms of referral to a dietitian, that gives them the capability. People also though need to have the opportunity. And so we know from Mortite phase one, you can make the physical and the social 
um, opportunity around a team member easier so that they actually want to do the behavior or only can do that behavior. So a great example of physical is making it easy to do the right thing. So for example, in your electronic medical record, if you have such, you could actually embed the CNST questions right into the EMR and they can't be bypassed by nursing staff and automatically when two yeses are re leading to referral to a dietitian, it really makes that process simple for nursing staff then to refer to the dietitian. And you basically have made the environment easy for them to do the right thing. The other way to change opportunities is social. So making it the behavior that everybody expects. And so this comes down through training and through mentoring and modeling. You can have rules. You can uh, provide an example to inspire folks and reduce barriers as well as a way to make it a norm in the hospital. And it's really uh, great to hear Celia talk about the, the um, interviews she's done with her uh, champions and others in the phase one sites at the sustainability. She did some interviews in the past couple of months to hear people say, well, it's the norm now. This is the way we do it. And that means we change the opportunity. It's just accepted practice. Motivation is believing that the behavior is the good thing to do. We should be doing this. And so a key part of your initial activities with your team members and your sites is getting them to talk about how could it be better? What will be the things that make nutrition care better? Because everybody has a sense that there can be improvements, I think, with respect to nutrition in hospital. So you can inspire them, provide incentives, provide education as well as persuasion. And also make it the desirable thing to do. So creating positive emotions from doing that behavior. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of those be, um, positive emotions. Incentives are another way to make it very motivating for team members to do the right thing. So these are some behavior change techniques. And when we're working through implementing during phase two, these are the sorts of things we'll be coaching you on and hopefully other, um, the phase one sites, the champions will be coaching phase two sites on as well, saying these are some things we did that really helped to motivate or support team members with making change. So education, just unpack that one um, behavior change technique. It's about information about the problem, information about consequences to behavior, for example, feedback on behavior, feedback on outcomes of behavior, reminders, prompts, cues, and self-monitoring of behavior. <clears throat> Excuse me. It can be done in a variety of ways. Um, <clears throat> excuse me again, in person, opinion leaders, stories or testimonials, print materials, um, print and digital materials, videos, and making standard operating procedure as well. So, <clears throat> excuse me for that. One example would be, I think uh, one of the sites gave a really nice um, testimonial about what happened to a patient when they weren't screened on admission in terms of their length of stay and what happened to them because screening was absent. And this really helped to motivate the, um, the management and the site implementation team and others in the team to see that, yes, we can do better. And so those sorts of ways of educating in unique and varied ways to motivate uh, staff is a key thing that is worthy of considering for implementation. Training. So demonstrating how the change needs to happen, instructions on how to do the behavior, feedback to team members on their behavior in a one-to-one, -one. feedback on outcomes of behavior, and self-monitoring of the behavior. So some ways to deliver training, review written procedures with people, watch a video, review the procedure verbally, model the behavior, do a role play, observe and review uh, uh, the approach that team members have taken to doing the activity. All of those would be considered training. So you might think outside of the box about some of the ways we can approach this. This is a very busy slide. I don't expect you to look at this in a lot of detail, but the point I'm trying to make here uh, with this slide, we had our team members here at UW tracking all the various behavior change techniques used in phase one at various time points of the implementation year by the type of activity that was undergoing. So screening, for example, here or SGA. And so you can see that a lot of effort was put on uh, screening in the first few months, and then that dwindled over time. So by the end of the implementation phase, very little time was being spent with screening because it was embedded within the process. It was really more about reminders and keeping up that level of, of um, activity. So that's the first key thing is that you might have 
um, ebbs and flows with respect to doing behavior change techniques to support the three behaviors we're hoping to uh, each phase two site to take on, the screening, the triage with SGA, and the MedPass. In addition, I hope you get from this slide that it's a variety of techniques. So on the bottom here are the color coding. You can see that enablement is red, education is blue, environmental restructuring is green. Those are the three big things that our sites in phase one use to make change. And so it's a combination of techniques. It's not just all education or just environmental restructuring. And so thinking about COM-B, you realize that a variety of techniques are really needed to make that change happen. And so this is just another way of showing across time the, the magnitude of those changes. And so you can see again that education was big for us, blue, green was environmental restructuring, and enablement. So those are the big three factors that led to behavior change which were used by phase one sites. Coercion was never used. Persuasion was used at the beginning with respect to trying to get people to understand that nutrition care was relevant to the patient population in their unit. So just unpacking those behavior change techniques a little bit more. Education looked like teaching sessions for staff on SGA, for example, or teaching on the importance of ONS, uh, talking to staff members about how we actually get the concept of the RD happening, teaching sessions as well on monitoring food intake. And this could be, for example, walking through the procedure, uh, getting feedback from the team members who need to do that activity and getting them to ask their questions in a more of a, a role play scenario, for example. Educating families on the importance of food intake. All of those are behavior change techniques in education that can take various forms. So for example, posters could be used for educating families. The mode could be quite different depending on the audience and the way we do the education. Some examples of environmental restructuring were things like adding the CNST to existing forms or adding it into the EMR, adding whiteboards in uh, patient rooms to indicate food intake and the barriers to food intake. So we had one site that created these lovely boards um, that actually had the plate with the portion consumed and food service workers could tick off where the uh, food intake was for the patient that day. Um, we also had another site that put in whiteboards that uh, identified did the person need glasses or a dentition or needed support with eating assistance in terms of promoting the standard of care for all patients. Forms were added to doors to initiate the action when food intake was less than 50%. This was another one of our phase one sites that did this. And so they made it very easy for team members who picked up the tray to note that food intake was low at that meal, what action should be taken then as a result of that, and accountability with respect to that action. Making the med pass order very automatic for SGA Bs and Cs. So as soon as a B or C patient was identified with SGA, it was an automatic process to institute MedPass, and so that was an easy way to get that started for folks. And then finally, implementing a, a volunteer meal assistance program was a way of um, environmentally restructuring things to make it really easy for team members to have support from a volunteer. So in addition to the behavior change techniques, we wanted to show you the success with changing knowledge, attitude, and practice in team members and again this is part of Celia's thesis and she's published this already so we can send you those papers. So all sites had uh, done a knowledge attitude practice questionnaire at baseline in phase one and then at the end of the implementation phase in uh, the end of 2016. And we compared the results of those two questionnaires and found that um, there was an increase in knowledge and attitude practice scores over the year, which means people's knowledge, attitude, and practices improved. As well, 70% of the staff reported that there was some positive change with respect to nutrition care in the hospital as a result of impact being implemented in the prior year. In addition to that, some key learnings and why it drives home the importance for champions and the site implementation team to involve the greater team in the decision making and how to do the change. Those team members who felt they were actually part of the change process and felt involved had higher uh, knowledge, attitude and practice scores at the implementation uh, end of implementation phase. So by involving your team members in that process, they're going to be more engaged and 
potentially take on better knowledge, attitude, and practices as a result. Okay, and so you'll see that that's part of our ingredients for success in our recipe is to involve the broader team in decision making and thinking through the processes. Of note, we're not requiring you to do this questionnaire, but it's available for you to use if you want in a, as a phase two site uh, and those who might scale beyond that um, to use that knowledge attitude practice questionnaire to help your team members understand where they're at now and where they might, might want to make some improvements. So staff involvement is a definite important part of the change process for improving nutrition care. So how do we make change happen? So we've talked a little bit about combi activities and various behavior change techniques to change the capability, opportunity, and motivation of your team members. How does it actually get into place? We'll use a plan, do, study, act cycle. We won't unpack this in a lot of detail today. We'll take our third webinar in this series to talk about screening specifically and giving some um, concrete examples about how to get screening going using a plan, do, study, act cycle. But the key is that by using a plan, do, study, act cycle, which is essentially taking a small um, planning out a process, thinking about it through the site implementation team and consulting the greater team members, then doing a little trial, not doing a full rollout, um, and seeing how it works and gathering a little bit of information from those folks involved in the initial rollout to get their feedback on how it needs to be tweaked, that's the study part, and then fixing the process that's the ACT part. All of that, by doing the, the PDSA, we also find that increases the person, the, the team member's capability, motivation, and opportunity. So a PDSA, in brief, is what are we trying to achieve? That's a plan piece. And your site implementation teams will be documenting these plans as you go forward. You're going to test out that little plan. You're going to study, see what worked and what didn't, and then what actions are needed to make the change happen. As I said, our third webinar will deal with this cycle in much more detail, taking the example of screening for you. So what do we think are the ingredients in Mortite phase one? And again, this is distilling a lot of work from Celia's thesis, as well as the learning across the champions and team members and developing the virtual toolkit together as a team here at UW with our champions. So we first off have to have the desire to do better. And so how we did that in phase one was we actually had discussion groups with unit team members looking at their own data and talking about how can we do better. And that led to the desire to do better. So data is really supportive of making that change and why we use the impact audits. Clear and regular communication between the champion and us to support you, but also the champion and the site implementation team and the site implementation team and the unit team. I'll also include there the management because they're actually supporting that site implementation team and the unit team with making those changes. Teamwork. This is not about one person, the champion, implementing change. It's about the champion leading change. Relevant people need to be involved at the right time. So with screening, you're going to want to involve the right roles at the right time that would be involved in that. So, for example, probably dietitians, probably the director of care, probably nursing staff who would be doing the screening or other folks that you're designating to do the screening in your unit. Those people need to be involved in that planning. You need to have what we call responsive leadership. And so I have a little um, uh, a metaphor at the end that we'll talk about from the Eden Alternative that is an example of what is responsive leadership. So it's rather than being reactive and top down, it's really much more of a, um, a model that supports and adapts to the needs of the team. And so it's uh, a very different form of leadership that we hope that uh, you'll take on as part of this. Staying realistic and flexible is key. Um, realizing that change does not open, happen overnight attitude that we're in this together and so this is a key step in making change is getting your team rallied around this idea of we can do better and we are going to build a nutrition culture together and so that comes from appreciation of the team fellow team members and understanding of we all can be part of this we need to know what to do and that's the impact toolkit that's on the uh, 
CMTF website, the virtual toolkit we call it. That's all of the what. And there's a variety of resources and tools for you to use and uh, to implement screening, SJ, MedPass, and other aspects of NPAC. As well, knowing what to do comes from asking your own unit, knowing what are the priorities for them. And so if they feel that a key aspect around standard care is also needed to make change and that you see as a champion site so implementation team is a key thing we need to move on, then please feel free to move on that as part of this uh, multi phase two as a key way of building that team and seeing the benefits to the patients that will help feedback into the patient, uh, oh, sorry, the team members feeling successful and desiring the motivation to keep going. Collecting and using data. This was invaluable in phase one and why it's built into phase two as impact audits and feedback. And we're trying to create a system that is um, self uh, use in terms of putting your own data in and coming out in terms of your own audits. So you can look at your data and uh, use it in, in any way you say, see fit in your own hospital. And then finally, mentorship and coaching. Us as external facilitators, Bridget Davidson, Suya Lor, Renata Valaitis, and myself at UW, um, co-internal facilitators, that's our co-champions, or sorry, champions at phase one sites, but also you might have champions uh, who have done implementation in your own setting before now that could be seen as internal facilitators and supports for you as champions as part of More to Eat phase two. And you're likely to have, in some hospitals, quality improvement specialists or committees in your hospital. You can draw on their expertise about how to make change and make improvements with respect to nutrition care. So our recipe for making change. These are the steps we think you need to go through. And they are certainly feedback as well in terms of uh, circling back uh, in terms of uh, how they happen in, in terms of uh, timeline. But you got to start first with building your improvement team. So that site implementation team and why we ask for a champion and then your very next step is thinking about who's going to be on your improvement team to target the three key activities of impact that we're targeting in phase two. Talk to your staff. We've got tools available for you. We're not dictating that you use any of them, but talking to the staff is a key step, whether it be discussion groups over uh, a pizza lunch with team members to talk about how can we make things better for our patients on this unit with respect to nutrition care. Collect unit level data, and that's impact audit, but other unit level data. So when you're doing your PDSA cycles, you'll collect informal data that is never sent to us here at UW to look at, but is used by your set implementation team to see how successful you're being with making a change. Create motivation. And so this is why we start with a baseline impact audit and hoping that you'll take that back to your team members um, to digest and think about how we can make change. And also why we've created um, standard PowerPoints from Mortique phase one about the success um, with respect to how we can make change. Keep everyone engaged in your team. Break down silos across um, sectors in your hospital. Communicate, and I can't emphasize that enough. It almost needs to have uh, three communicates there. It's constant. You want to embed the activity into routine or it's not going to stay. And that's by using the PDSA cycles, the audit and feedback, and using some of the environmental restructuring techniques to make it really stick. Standardize the process by making it easy to do um, and uh, complete. Evaluate and report. Celebrate successes. Re-energize the message when it starts to flag a bit or when you start to see some, um, some uh, drop off in terms of success and it, which always happens right there's little dips as you saw in the figures that we started at the very beginning dips in the in the processes don't lose focus engage new staff and then expand on your success because people want to see growth and so once we found in phase one that screening was going on and SGA was going on and MedPass was starting, people wanted to expand beyond that. And that's great. And all of the phase one sites have already expanded beyond their initial phase one study unit because of this notion that you got to keep growing on the success um, that you have developed. People want to keep up the momentum. So build your improvement team. 
uh, you want two to five key people in addition to the champion. We would suggest that you want to have team members that are working right at on the unit in the care activity that you're dealing with. And once that um, impact activity, maybe screening is uh, and med pass are complete, and you're then thinking about standard care, you might then think about uh, switching out the people that are on the implementation team. That's absolutely fine. But you can see there are a list of key folks that might be relevant as team members on the unit. You also want some people that are influential. And uh, so someone, a couple of people at the management level help to build an accountability. Um, and they also know some of the systems around team members to help facilitate and, and encourage that environmental restructuring that's often needed or enablement uh, that's needed to support team members to do the work that we want them to do. And so it's good to have some of the site implementation team being more at a, a little bit higher level of management. So after you've got your site implementation team initially developed, you're going to want to talk to the staff. So discussion groups, build awareness that change is needed. Uh, you can uh, start some of that imminently um, with some of the PowerPoints that we've got created as standard slide decks on the More to Eat uh, virtual toolkit. What do they see as needs to, needs to be changed? What are their ideas for change? Where do they think you need to start? You could do the staff knowledge attitude practice questionnaire with your unit teams. You could also do quick one-on-one -on -one chats with physicians and others who might not be part of some of your larger group discussions. So start talking it up in terms of building the interest in this project. And um, I don't like to use the term project because that suggests it ends. I think we want to say it's an initiative. It's really an ongoing activity of um, more phase one and two hospitals. We're going to collect data. The impact auditors are key from the data, but there's other ways of collecting data. So you collect local data. Um, you might have student project data that you collected through if you've got interns or other students who collected data about um, what's going on in your hospital that could be used to build in motivation again for your team members. Maybe there's other data that you collected, like patient satisfaction, for example, around food. You want to though understand your processes and your context. And so whatever that is that you need to gather, your site implementation team is going to need that to think about what needs to change and how can we make things better. You want to create motivations to show how improving nutrition care will help with patients, discussion groups and sharing the findings in more phase one, local data and how um, your baseline results are not necessarily stacking up to the ideal in terms of uh, care for patients. Conversations with key decision makers, for example, taking a patient story to them about, you know, this is what's happening to patients when they're not screened, they're staying longer in hospital. Stories about why change is needed. Um, and of course, the knowledge attitude practice question, if you choose to use that, could be also a way to build motivation in your team members. So building the change. This is actually uh, another theoretical framework. I won't go through this in detail for us today because of essence of time, but you can see it's very um, consistent with what we ended up doing in phase one. It's also very consistent with the knowledge to action model that I talked about at the very beginning, this idea that you have to build, you have to um, enlist a variety of people in the effort, you have to enable them to be making the change. You have to find those early wins that show success and build momentum and motivation, and then keep um, building uh, that change and instituting it to make, make it really embedded. So it's just another model that you can think through in terms of, um, of thinking about making change. This is Celia's model from her thesis work, and uh, this is based on actually phase one implementation, pre-implementation interviews that were done with sites. And so they already had this natural wisdom within them when, we, uh, when she did the interviews that talked about how could we make change and how could it, could it really work for us. And this is even before they started to make change. So they knew this already, and we distilled it into, or Cecilia distilled this into her model here. So the key is that you have to build a reason to change. And it's really about engaging the team members to see that we can improve the nutrition care for patients. Team members want to do the best for their patients, right? And so building that reason to make change and seeing the benefit to patients is a key part of it. You want to involve relevant people in the change process. And so we talked already about that, the site implementation team, but also the greater team. You need to embed it in the current practice if it's going to really make change stick. 
And you've got to account for the fact that every unit has its own climate, its own uh, areas that need to be massaged or tailored to with respect to impact implementation. And on the right hand side in red, it's really about building the team. And so a large part of the work that happens within impact and within behavior change is really about building the team to see um, that they can do this together and can achieve uh, a greater outcome for the patients as a result of screening SGA, MedPass and other impact activity. So some key learnings from Celia's work. I won't read all the um, the blue font, which is some quotes. But you need to, as I say, build a reason to change. They have to understand why they want to change their practice. They have to see it benefiting the patient. You need to involve the right people in that change process. So breaking down department silos, as we already discussed. We need to think about embedding it in terms of decreasing the, the burden to staff, listening to staff so that they feel like they're part of the change process. Uh, use the existing structures that you already have to make it really easy to make the change happen. So if you know that you're going to be going about a change in uh, um, leadership or a change in a form, for example, in X amount of time, targeting that for when you're going to make your change. Accounting for climate, as we always said, context is really key. You have constraints that you're working within, and that's going to affect your capacity to make change. Building the strong relationships so that we're all in it together attitude is essential to doing that. And as I said, I have a, a metaphor from the Eden Alternative that shows you as a leader, a responsive leader, how you can start to support that we're all in this together um, thinking. So some key aspects to hammer home for you guys today. Champions can't do this alone. This is not a one person effort. This is a team and key team members are part of that site implementation team, but then the broader team as well. Your context will rule. So for our phase one sites who are thinking about spread or moving into other units, they're gonna find they can do some things automatically because of the first unit, but some things are not going to be as easy to change. And they have to retweak or tailor the way they do things because it's a different unit that they're spreading to, whether it be a surgical unit or another medical unit or some other unit. I hope you've gotten from this presentation that education is not enough. There's other things we need to do, thinking about Com B as a way of changing behavior. And as I said at our third webinar in this series, we'll give you a bit more structure around how to do that with the example of screening. Using data and feedback is extremely influential, whether it be the formalized impact audits or more informal data that your site implementation team will be collecting. And then finally, be flexible, be realistic. That's part of responsive leadership as well. Reminder that the impact implementation toolkit is on the website. And if you haven't started to go through that in detail yet, we would encourage you to do so over the next couple of months and find out some of the resources that are there that are helpful for the three key activities we're hoping that phase two sites will implement. So some tools just to uh, identify a few key things you might uh, look for on the website. There's questions that we used in discussion groups during phase one that Sue did as part of her focus groups that are there for you to use to, to uh, start your own discussion groups with unit teams to motivate them and garner their interest in this process and what they think needs to change. There's some readiness checklists from the literature actually, not ones we created, but from the implementation science literature that says, are we ready to make this change? PowerPoint presentations about impact, about malnutrition and why it's relevant to acute care, about all of the findings from the original CMTF study, as well as some of the other work we've done. We'll be putting up some slide decks as well in the near future based on more phase one and some of the success uh, with the new publications that are coming out. The staff knowledge attitude practice questionnaire is there as well as lots of other resources and tools. So examples of how things were done, forms that were used by phase one sites, et cetera. They're all categorized by the impact activity, whether it be screening or discharge process for you to find and use in your own setting. So with that, I'm gonna end off with our metaphor and then we'll have some time for questions. So this is borrowed from the Eden Alternative. Um, I do a little bit of work as well in long-term care and Eden Alternative is actually a group that's uh, trying to move the culture of care within long-term care in North America, especially towards what we call social model of care or care where um, people live in residences, it's truly their home. It's not medicalized uh, as it has been in the past. 
So I'll refer you to that group if you're interested in more of this work for uh, any other activities you may have. So first off, there's some key terminology. The gardener is you as champions. It's also your site implementation team, quite frankly. So um, I remember, I think it might've been Roseanne from phase one saying, we're all champions on our site implementation team, right? That we're all in this together. And so um, it's all those people that are the driving force behind the change. That's the gardeners, right? The garden soil is your hospital setting, where the growth is gonna happen. It has to be sufficiently warm. And it's, in essence, the motivation. There has to be that motivation there to make change. And the other aspects, we'll talk about what warrant is in just a moment, that make it um, a thing that we want to do in terms of making change. The harvest for us is better nutrition for our patients. Growth is the improvements that will lead to that better nutrition care for our patients. So basically, the growth is getting impact into place, that better care. The plants our management, staff, your colleagues, volunteers who make the change, those are the people that actually grow, okay? They're the ones that actually change. The climate is the underlying values that drive people's actions. It's also the climate of the unit, the climate of the hospital. And so that um, will affect how change happens. Frost is all those things that make growth impossible. It could be negative attitudes. It could be thinking everything is working just fine and we don't need to make change. It could be people that are much more concerned about the cost of things rather than the outcomes uh, that we wanna see happen. It could be the naysayers that say, where's the evidence? It could be a variety of things. Lack of trust though is a big part of this as well. And so responsive leader is really about trying to get rid of the frost that is there in the, the garden that is affecting the growth. So a foolish gardener sows seeds on frozen ground. They haven't spent the time to warm up the soil and make it a place that's trusting, a place that's ready to make change, a place where people are engaged. A foolish gardener seeds, and we'll call this education here in our context, and expects it to work doesn't think about all the other things that need to happen with that seed to make growth happen. They'll prepare the soil, they'll seed, but then they walk away expecting fruit. So again, they're, they're neglecting some of the other things that need to happen, like the environmental restructuring, the enabling, the support, the reminders that keep uh, growth going. A wise gardener waits for the ground to be warm. They build trust, they develop a strong team, they get people ready to make change by making them motivated to see that a change is necessary. They realize that seeding is just the first step. Education is a one-off and they'll keep doing that education in a variety of ways, but they'll also do watering, weeding, and protecting against the frost. And that's enabling, motivating, re-educating, educating in different ways, doing other sorts of training to keep that growth happening. They also realize that gardens take continual work. This is an ongoing effort. This is a garden that isn't a project. It is a long-term uh, process. And so we're trying to help you build in the reminders, the re-education. And once you've got some of these changes embedded, the team takes over this, not you as a champion insight implementation team leading this. Nursing takes over, for example, screening. It just becomes a norm that we do this. Dietitians, it just becomes a norm that we do SGA. It just becomes a norm that we put a med pass in automatically when a patient is identified to be malnourished. It just becomes a normal way of practice. A foolish gardener also weeds, waters, prunes, prunes, and prunes some more, so much so that they forget to prick the fruit. A gardener uh, is also foolish when they think the garden will bear fruit the same amount every month. So once they've got uh, what they think is the growth happening, they, they pull off and they expect it to be the same month to month. A foolish gardener will also uproot the plants when they lose faith and so they will not produce. And so this is uh, basically uh, affecting your team members and your management, all those others around you. You're basically um, passing on a negative attitude in essence to those plants. The wise gardener doesn't micromanage. They can, that 
frustrates the, the team members, right? They allow for some, um, some individual creativity around the change. They look for excellence, but they do not look for perfection. They also know that sometimes there's going to be less fruit. So some months you're going to be off on your screening and some months you're going to be better. Some months when dietitians go on, on vacation, SJ is not going to happen as readily because of a covered staff and short staffing and things like that. They understand that. That's realistic, right? They take the long view with respect to embedding these practices. The wise gardener always warms the soil, fertilizes, irrigates, and protects from frost. They stick with it when it gets hard. If you don't experience frost, and you will, and we saw that with our, um, with our interviews at baseline that Celia did, with the champions trying to make change and finding some naysayers or some of those more challenging team members who said, oh, this isn't going to work. Everybody experienced frost in phase one. If you don't experience frost, you likely haven't made a real change, right? It was already something that was there and it just needed to be tweaked. There wasn't a lot of change that needed to happen. A change in the way things happen or the culture of care, and in this case, nutrition care and acute care hospitals, is gonna consume warmth. It's gonna steadily need to be infused in terms of support. And that's what the champions do. As you champions on the line today, as well as your site implementation teams and those beyond it, who are your advocates within your hospital and system to make change. You need to continually warm the soil. Okay. Oh, I seem to have. And warmth. What is that? It's appreciation. It's acknowledgement. It's respectful and positive communication. It's actions that uh, lead to a trusting and safe environment. It's cooperation. It's teamwork. It's using words that are then expressed in action. So doing good deeds. It's the generosity of spirit, the kindness and forgiveness that happens when we are creating a garden and having growth. So I'll just actually give uh, one example that comes to mind um, from um, our hospital that was site one. Uh, Michelle was our, one of our champions at that site and um, she made a cake when they got MedPass implemented and it was starting to be embedded and she made a cake for the um, for the team and took it to them. It's actually, I think it was the shape of, of the MedPass bottle, I think, that they used uh, as a way of showing appreciation. It's those little things um, that really get a team feeling like they are uh, being acknowledged and respected and appreciated for the efforts they're making. So we suggest to our champions to use data to support that appreciation, show people that they're doing a good job and acknowledge that um, informally and formally. And so you can even think of having, say you're putting a, a standard care change in with respect to volunteers, you could have a volunteer award for the quarter, for a volunteer that was exemplary in their attendance and helping patients with setup and getting ready for the meal. There's all sorts of ways that can be done to make that warmth happen with respect to making change. So. Frost doesn't kill the garden. The only thing that's going to change, that's only going to kill this initiative in your hospital is you. It's the garden fails only when the gardener walks away. And so that's when the champions stop being champions. The site implementation team stops being the champions for having nutrition as um, a way of being, in essence, in your acute care. And so if you remember back to the um, the quotes that came out of Celia's work with the champions, one of the, um, one of the quotes said, you know, I've never felt this way before as a dietitian in the work that I do. And I think this is part of what they're speaking to, this idea that it's a different way of seeing our role as champions in the hospital about making change for our patients. So another just final quote before we end off and uh, have some questions. If your actions inspire others, to dream more, to learn more, to do more and become more, you are a leader. And that's what responsive leadership is about. So your first steps over the next couple of months between now and when you start to implement impact in June or July, once you get your ethics done, of course, and data agreements and all those sorts of things. Between now and the next meeting, recruit your members to your implementation team. Start to meet, 
find those people who are already really passionate about this and those who maybe are the naysayers as well, but see that they are influential to perhaps making change in the unit. Start to meet, start to think about and to build awareness of the impact with that group, what needs to change and how we need to make that change happen. You can actually do the, the knowledge attitude practice question with your team members and start to think about the greater team, what sort of educational activities will work for us when we start doing this in June in terms of implementing impact. We don't want to take any active role in terms of making change yet. It's really just building your site implementation team and getting them starting to think along the process. Okay. We want to review the impact toolkit resources that are there if you haven't already and determine how your impact audits will be done and by whom, so that those people can be invited to the next webinar. We're talking about the impact audit uh, completion and the templates for the reports that you'll be using to feedback data to your team members. So with that, I think we're gonna turn off the recording um, at this point, Bridget, if you don't mind, and I'm gonna switch from full screen.